I'm sorry for the delay. I'm trying to get connected to the internet to show you a uh, demonstration. And it's just sitting here, spinning away, doing nothing. Is anybody else on either the wireless or the wireless premiere in the room? I may ask to use your laptop later if I can't get this. I got there. So we're going to start with a demonstration, and I just want to do, you to do what you're told to do. attention. This is an example of how our attentional systems work and don't work. If you think about the studies you've heard about, about talking on the cell phone and accident rate, I presume all of you are familiar with that. If you're talking on the cell phone, in the car, hands-free, perfectly legal in California, your probability of having an accident is about the same as if your blood alcohol content is 0.12. That is 50% more than the legal level for DWI. You have 50% more alcohol. You're about equally likely as when you're talking on the cell phone. Why is that? When we are paying attention to one thing, we don't pay attention to others. Now, why is talking on the cell phone worse than talking to somebody in the car with you? Think about the times you've been a passenger, and all of a sudden there's a car coming in from the right about to crash into you. Do you keep carrying on the conversation? Probably not. You may shriek, look out. There are a variety of things you might do. That is, somebody in the car is responsive to the outside environment there. Somebody you're talking to on the telephone elsewhere doesn't know you're about to be killed and therefore fails to warn you. Okay, young kids' attention is controlled primarily by stimuli, the things out there in the world. If you get a nice bell that's shiny and you can jingle in front of a baby, they'll turn to it. You jingle something else over here, they'll turn and look at that. Part of development is taking active control of our attentional system. The demonstration you just saw, the instruction was to attend to the people in the white shirts passing the basketball. You're really good at that if you pay attention to it. Okay? And apparently most of you did. But that means you don't take in other information. What you learn out of a class, what you learn when you're reading a book, what you learn in lots of different circumstances, 
depends on what you're actively paying attention to. And we've all had that experience of either being in a lecture or even reading a book. The information goes by, and all of a sudden you realize you don't remember any of it. Attention, paying attention to what you want to learn is crucial for moving information into long-term memory. And it's a skill we acquire over time. Okay, I'm gonna do another demonstration now. I'm gonna read a set of sentences followed by a question. And I want you, out loud, to answer the question at the end of each sentence. It'll become obvious. The girl broke the window on the porch. Broke what? Window. The tree in the front yard shaded the man who was smoking his pipe. Where? The hill was steep. Was what? The cat running from the barking dog jumped on the table. From what? The tree was tall. Was what? The old car climbed the hill. What did? The cat running from the dog jumped on the table. Where? The girl who lives next door broke the window on the porch. Lives where? The car pulled the trailer. Did what? The scared cat was running from the barking dog. What was? The girl lives next door. Who does? The tree shaded the man who was smoking his pipe. What did? The scared cat jumped on the table. What did? The girl who lives next door broke the large window. Broke what? The, the man was smoking his pipe. Who was? The, the old car climbed the steep hill. The what? The We're almost done, hang in there. The large window was on the porch. Where? The, the tall tree was in the front yard. What was? The car pulling the trailer climbed the steep hill. Did what? The, the cat jumped on the table. Where? On the, table. the tall tree in the front yard shaded the man. Did what? The, the car pulling the trailer climbed the hill. Which car? The dog was barking. Was what? The window was large. What was? Okay. Now, what I'd like you to do, oops, I have to go back. Here are a set of sentences. We're going to do this by a division of the house. Not literally dividing. You're going to stand up to show that you believe you heard a particular sentence. So everybody who thinks they heard sentence one, stand up. Nobody heard sentence one. Everybody who believes they heard sentence two, please stand up. Ah, got a little unanimity there. Everybody who believes they heard sentence three, stand up. Everybody who believes they heard sentence four, stand up. There's a little bit of a crowd effect here. Somebody's courageous and other people then join in. Everybody who believes they heard sentence five, stand up. Everybody who believes they heard sentence six, stand up. Everybody who believes they heard sentence seven, stand up. We have unanimity on no on seven, okay. Everybody who believes they heard sentence eight, stand up. 
Everybody who believes they heard sentence nine stand up. And finally, everybody who believes they heard sentence 10 stand up. Okay, notice a couple of the sentences don't fit in with the information you heard. And you were really good at saying you didn't see those. But I'm sad to tell you, you didn't hear any of those sentences. <laughs> Zero. Okay. Our memory systems are set up most of the time for us to gather information. We're not very good at knowing exactly what it was we heard. We know the meaning that we extract from what we hear. So there are lots of examples of our making errors about the specifics of what happened but still having the general knowledge from those sentences be something that we acquire. So now let me tell you a little story. I used to teach introductory psychology, and the first day of class, I set up the following thing. I got a guy I knew who was on the football team, he was, in fact, a lineman from the football team. He was both taller and a lot bigger than me. To come in at the very beginning of class and say, Dr. Cooper, I need to talk to you about my grade. I said, I'm having a class here. He said, but you gave me the wrong grade. And I said, I can't talk to you now. He said, I really need to talk to you. So I shut him. pushes me back. I reach in my pocket and pull out a knife. Now the knife is a prop, a stage prop from the theater department. I pull out the knife, he knocks it out of my hand, and then goes out the door. So you got the picture, there's little me and this big, tall, black guy from the football team. <laughs> so I, I look at the class and say, I'm going to go get the cops. You write down exactly what happened. Everybody with me? He pushed me first. He pulled out the knife. That is, what people saw was consistent with what they expected to see. Little old psychology professors don't push around big linemen. That's not something that happens. There are all kinds of demonstrations that what we remember, what we learn, what we think we experience, are influenced by what we expect. That has some real advantages. You know a lot of things about how lectures work. When you walk into the room, you're prepared to learn in a lecture. You have an idea that somewhere toward the beginning of the lecture, I should tell you what the hell I'm gonna talk about. When we get to the end of the lecture, I should tell you what I told you. You know, beginning, introduction, and end, summary. That sets you up to learn the information, but it also, because we have expectations, we sometimes don't accurately remember things. So, our, the, the part of memory I want to talk about here, memory is divided into short-term memory and long-term memory. Short-term memory is the kind of information you're conscious of. So if I give you some numbers, 572, you can hold that in short-term memory. So if I now ask you, what numbers did I give you? 572. Okay. And there are a lot of studies of that kind of short-term memory. But to move information from short-term memory to long-term memory is what really gives us our knowledge about the world. It's what gives us our knowledge about our own autobiography. We experience things and then we store it in long-term memory. Okay. 
That takes focused attention and a variety of strategies, which we will talk about as we go along here. The example I just gave you that I used from the class, actually I should tell you one other thing about that. The first time I did it, there were a number of people in the class who didn't believe me. So the second semester when I did it, just like here, I set up a video camera at the back of the room so that we had a video record of what happened. There were about 60 people in the class. 59 of them believed me when I showed them the video record. One of them insisted that that didn't happen, that we must have faked the video before the event. But the video camera was at the back of the room, and there she was in the second row, and I, I could point to her and say, look, but you're in the frame. You were there when this happened. She still wasn't convinced, okay? So a practical note out of this is, if you're ever on a jury, the least reliable data in court is eyewitness testimony. And we do, when we do studies of jury decision making, juries weigh eyewitness testimony much more. It has a much bigger influence on how they decide a case than the circumstantial evidence, whereas the circumstantial evidence is, in fact, much more reliable. And I presume all of you are aware of the people who've been convicted, some guys sitting on death row, and then data becomes available later that proves they didn't do it. Uh, so there are errors in our jury decision system, and you can avoid those by knowing that eyewitness testimony isn't very reliable in general. Eyewitness identification of other people is particularly suspect when one person is from one racial or ethnic group identifying somebody from a different racial or ethnic group. Those identifications, those memories are particularly poor. Okay. So now let me ask you a question. You've all seen the full moon rising. That happens about 12 times a year for you. So think about how old you are. Think of how many times you've had a chance to see the full moon or a near full moon rising. My question to you is, where is the sun when the full moon is rising? If you think you know, raise your hand and we'll see how many. Got one person back here, a couple over here. Okay, let me point out, if it happens 12 times a year and you're about 20 years old, that means you've seen this about 240 times. Additionally, it's not just when it's exactly the full moon. You get the same effect the day before the, the full, it's a full moon and the day after. So you actually have three opportunities every month to learn the answer to this question. So you should think about, why don't I know this? Because you've all seen it. Okay, tell us where the sun is with the full moon. Yeah, just as the moon comes up, the sun is setting, okay, because that's, actually I'll go to my next slide here, that's the relative position of the sun, the earth, and the moon that is required if the face of the moon that is facing the earth is going to be fully illuminated by the sun. Okay. Why don't you know that? You never stopped to pay attention to it. So it happens all the time, and we do learn some things without focused attention. Attention, But a lot goes on in our world that we miss because we don't focus attention on it. Okay. So one part of this story about the development of memory is that memory is an active process. It is in fact not the case that everything you know is stored in memory. 
much of what you know, you reconstruct from what is stored in memory. But our, when we recall a memory, it is our recollection of things, plus using our rational mind to say, well, if that's true, then this must be true, and this must be true, and this must be true. We get better and better at that when we are, as we grow older. So here, how many people can remember the color of the front door on their house when they were seven years old? Raise your hand. Fair number of people in the room. Now, how many people can remember what happened at their second birthday party? Notice very few. This is an example of a general phenomenon um, of infantile amnesia. We don't remember what happened typically for about the first two to two and a half years of our life. Why don't we remember? Because the way we thought about it then, the way we encoded the memory, is different from the way we think about things now. So it's hard to reconstruct based on whatever is remaining we know young kids have memory. It's not that two-year-olds or even one-year-olds can't remember things. They remember things and they remember things. By one year of age, they'll remember things for up to three months. So they have relatively long-term memory. But as adults, we can't somehow access those memories. So part of being able to remember something is being able to find it. So you might think of the, your memory as being something like a library. I know people don't go to the library very much anymore, but I presume you've at least been over there to use the computers, if not to actually look at the books. Libraries are fun places, but there's a, a rule at the library that's really important. The rule is, if you take a book off the shelf, don't put it back on the shelf. Does everybody know that our library has that rule? I hope you do. Take it off the shelf, then you can put it on the, the little cart that they use for putting the books back on the shelf, but you don't put it back on the shelf. Can somebody tell me why? Why do we have that rule? Yes? Yes. And another way to say that is if somebody puts it in the wrong place, it's effectively not in the library because nobody can find it, because we search the library shelves by the call number on the book. So if it got put in the wrong place, and, and in fact, that happens, and so one of the things librarians have to do every year is go down every shelf in the whole library and make sure all the books on that shelf are in the right place. Same issue for memory. When you put something in the memory, you have to put it in, in a way that you can access it later. So now I'll give you a, a hint that will help you using your memories to do well on tests. It turns out we remember better if we have the same context in our head when we're trying to recall information as was there when we try to learn it. So I'll first tell you how the experiments have been done. Imagine I give a lecture here like this, and then you have to do a test on it. But we test you in some other location. So we divide the class in, in two. Half of you are tested here, and half of you are tested in a different location. And we look at the relative performance of the two groups. The group that is tested in the same place as where they learn the information will do better. Okay. I say, okay, 
that's an abstract fact, how can I use that? It turns out you don't have to actually be in the location. If you think about where you were, that is, you create a mental image of where you were, you think about what was going on, that is as good as physically being there. So if you like to study at home, if that's where you work on your biology class or your history class or whatever it is, when you're in the test, think about the room where you were, what time of day it was, and so on, when you learn the material, and you'll be better able to recall the material. Now let's go back to our sentence memory experiment for a moment. Notice how in listening to those sentences, you figured out the meaning of those sentences. If you can connect it to other meanings, those sentences aren't very good examples, but when you're learning something, the more other things you can the more other things you can connect it to, the more retrieval pathways you have built for recalling the information. So think about more than one thing it's related to. Take a very simple example. You're at a party and you're meeting people, and you're, so you're learning a lot of new names. I'll start by asking you, what strategies do you use if you meet somebody new? If you met me and somebody told you, my name's Henry, how do you remember my name's Henry? What would you do? I'm sorry, can you say it a little louder? Repeating is a good strategy because to repeat it, you actually have to pay attention to it. Another strategy is to think of somebody else with the name of Henry that you know who shares some features in common with me. You know, do you know any old Henrys who are bald? Something like that. Anything that allows you to think more about the meaning connected to other meanings helps you retrieve things. So I'm going to give you, let's see. I'm going to give you another memory task. I'm going to give you a, this is the way we measure the capacity of short-term memory. I'm going to give you a list of digits, one after the other, to the degree I can. I will say the digits every um, one digit per second. Then I'm going to ask you to repeat them back to me. Five. Nine, two, seven. Okay, so you can you can remember four things. That's good. An average four-year-old can remember four things. Okay, so let's try a little harder task. Four, two, five, three, five, two, four. Two, five, three, five, two, four. At least some of you got it. Okay, we'll try one more. Eight, zero, five, six, four, six, two, two, one, zero. Okay, let me, let me help you with that one. Let me do it a slightly different way. 805-646-2210. Okay, that is if I say it with a cadence that people would normally say a telephone number with, it's a relatively easy task. When I do it as simply a list of digits, it's harder. If I'd started out 8 billion, um, 54 million and so on, it's even harder still. How you organize the information. This is one of those examples of past learning helps. We're used to the cadence of telephone numbers. In other 
countries, they divide them up differently. So if you come from another country to the US and you hear somebody doing three digits, three digits, four digits, that may not fit into the organizational scheme you have for, they have for remembering telephone numbers. So it's important to build organizational schemes, practice them, that's a key part of learning. When we look at the development of memory skills, here's a way to do it. You give a kid a bunch of pictures, and you say, I want you to look at these pictures so that you can remember all of them and tell me what you saw. If you're going to do it with kids, you give them real simple little objects, trucks in the pictures, flowers, and so on. Here's the typical four-year-old response. You have the stack of pictures. Four-year-old will look through it once. OK, I know them. Then you test them, and they remember two to three of the pictures. You say, OK, let's try it again with a different stack of pictures. They do the same thing, same poor memory. Okay, the first step is like the one suggested over here for remembering names. Around age five or six, kids look at the picture and say the name of what's ever in the picture. That's the first mnemonic, active strategy for remembering things that we see in kids. Okay? and they remember more. There are a variety of ways of setting this up. One of them, rather than having them turn the pictures, had a uh, panel where you could see the pictures by pushing each part of the panel up to 16 pictures. So the four-year-old, so on. Okay, I know them all, and they remember two or three. The six-year-old says the name. By the time kids get to be 10, they do the following thing. They first go and look at all the pictures. Then they test themselves. So they say the name of what is in the picture before they push it and see if they're right. Self-testing. And their memory scores go way up. The next advance you can think about this from using flashcards for learning things. When you build a, a deck of flashcards, pretty soon you know some of them really well. Do you leave them in the stack? What the kids do is they go through, test themselves, they identify the ones that are having trouble mem remembering, and then they spend more of their study time on the ones they don't know, and only at the very end go back and test themselves on all of them. So their memory activities become directed toward those things that they're having a hard time learning. We know that one of the characteristics of effective students in high school and college is that they know what they know and they know what they don't know. And they put more of their study efforts on what they don't know. Knowing what you know and knowing what you don't know is a kind of meta-memory, knowing about the state of your memory. And it's a crucial piece of knowledge for guiding your own study. OK, there are other kinds of activities that people use for remembering certain specific kinds of things. So for an example, does anybody out there know the order of the planets from nearest the sun to furthest away? You got it. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus. So you were about to say Pluto if you learned when you were little. There's a wonderful book I would recommend to all of you. It's called 
How I Killed Pluto and Why It Deserved It. It's a really fun read. Okay, but frequently people will learn little sentences where the first word of each word in the sentence, so for many, for Mercury, very, for Venus, I'm using my own, eager, for Earth, Martians, and so on. That is, constructing something else that connects to the sequence is a kind of mnemonic. Another kind of mnemonic that was first developed by the Greeks. Both the Greeks and the Romans gave long speeches in their parliament, and they didn't have teleprompters, laptops, paper. They had to remember the whole speech. So what they would do to make sure they got all the points in their speech that they wanted is that they would associate each section of the speech with some location around the room. Okay, this is called the method of loci. You can do it, it doesn't have to be around the room. For those of you who travel from San Jose State uh, to your apartment somewhere, you can organize it around the sequence of um, off-ramps on the freeway or something like that. But it's a really good strategy for remembering things in order, is to associate them with geographical things that form a natural sequence. We have a common phrase in English that is based on this method of loci. When you're making an argument to somebody, they are perhaps disagreeing with you, and you say, no, you're wrong in the first place. Okay, well, the first place is where the first part of your argument is. And in the first place is a common speech construction in English. Okay. What am I doing here? I want to, actually I want to do one other thing and then I'll come back to this. I want to talk about egocentrism and role taking because it's another feature of cognitive processing that changes a lot over the course from preschool to adulthood. Imagine doing the following with a, a group of five-year-olds. You have them have a table with a bunch of things on it, and they're going to pick presents for their teacher, for their mother, for their father, and their sister. And on the table, there are books, neckties, toy trucks, fire engines, dolls, and so on. What does the typical four-year-old do in a situation like this? What would he give to his teacher? It's a four-year-old boy, and there's a nice red fire engine out there. He'll give a fire engine to the teacher, a fire engine to his mother. Why? What could be more wonderful than having a fire engine. It's very altruistic on the child's part. Unfortunately, it doesn't involve thinking about what the other person is thinking about and what the other person might want. Uh, more, and that's the situation I just described as part of a set of experiments on declining egocentrism and increasing role taking. Something that I observed just out there in the world that illustrates a similar thing is I was in a bookstore and this little girl put her fingers in her ears and she said, Daddy, can you hear me? He says, no. Okay. So she says more loudly, Daddy, can you hear me? Okay. Now let's think about this. If he said no, he must have heard her because he's responding to her question. She hadn't figured that out. And she thinks because putting her fingers in her ears affects her own hearing, that it would affect her daddy's hearing. You can see it in another 
anecdote, somebody else watching a little girl talking on the telephone to her grandmother who says, Grandma, look at my new shoes. Aren't they nice? Well, grandmother obviously can't see the shoes. So this is another, if you will, error in communication. Kids get better and better at understanding somebody else's perspective through the middle school years, although even adults make errors. They're probably the right age. Think of the last present your parents gave you without asking you what you wanted. Okay, what, one strategy to avoid this problem of predicting what somebody else wants is simply to ask them. But if they didn't ask you with the best of intentions, God knows they might have given you a Barry Manilow record or, or something. I mean, something that you have no, it, they did it with the best of intentions, okay? They were trying to think about what you might like, but they make a misprediction. A lot of what we need to do in order to be able to function effectively with one another is understand others' perspectives. And, and that skill continues to grow well past young adulthood. We get better and better at understanding more and more people. It is a particular problem when we're trying to understand people in a different culture. So just like the problem of extracting from memory when you're thinking about something differently than you did when you were two years old and therefore can't find it, trying to do role taking with members of other cultures is hard because you don't have the framework within which um, to think about what they're thinking. Okay, so let me finish up here that I will see you again when we have our panel discussion in front of you. Uh, the picture I want you to to have about how the cognitive system grows is that we are given biologically a structure that we're going to use to acquire more and more complex cognitive skills. Okay. But the biological structure provides some boundaries on that. Early experience, as we talked about in the last lecture, can have particular effects on how that biological structure gets rewired. Knowing how the system functions, things like the way our constructive processes are crucial in how our memory works, <laughs> is useful to you. Think of your head very much like your computer. The more you know about your computer, the better you can use your computer. The more about you know about your head, the better you can use your head to be an effective student here and presumably effective in whatever you do after you leave here. So thank you very much. Have a good afternoon.